right, everybody mellowed out now? Very good. Hey, I'm going to start out with a profound truth, and here it is. Children really take Christmas gifts very seriously. Shock. Hey, me too, me too. This is a most wonderful time of the year. Oh, kids, oh, kids, just think it won't be too much longer. Think about all those presents you'll soon be unwrapping. Oh, it won't be long now. Hey, here's a question. Uh, there's a few teachers in the room today. Do they still do the whole classroom gift exchange thing in schools? They still do? They don't? Not really? Okay, it was an oldie thing. Well, it used to be. A very, very big deal, at least it was, in Mr. Hahn's fourth grade class. We knew the procedure well. The first Monday after Thanksgiving break, Mr. Hahn would write down each one of our names on a slip of paper, and he dumped the little papers in the baseball hat and shake them all up, and then one, Miss Barry, you know, one by one, we stepped up to his desk, and we withdrew the name of the person to whom we would give a gift. Who would it be? Better question, who would get my name? And this is top secret stuff, and so we told no one. We told no one for whom we were shopping for, but we told everyone for what we were wanting. We dropped hints left and right everywhere and every day, and I made it very clear to each and every one of my classmates exactly what I wanted, which was a Nerf football. Got it? A Nerf Football, a Nerf football, which turns 50 years old next year. A little extra trivia, invented by a field goal kicker from the Minnesota Vikings. Huh? No extra charge. <laughs> Nerf footballs, though, only came in one color back then, orange. And they had a very, very interesting smell to them. Petrochemicals, I guess, you know. But no matter, it didn't affect me. No matter, it didn't affect me. No matter, it didn't affect me. <laughs> Uh, where was I? Okay, that's right. Yeah, I wanted a Nerf football. That's what I wanted, and everybody knew it. But apparently, Julie Lindahl wasn't listening. She broke my heart. For on the day of the great gift exchange, I ripped open the, uh, the wrapping paper off my box, only to discover stationary. Yeah, you heard that right. Stationary. Baby blue envelopes with folded note cards predicting a picture of a cow jumping over the moon. I mean, what 10-year-old uses stationery? I could barely write my own name. What was I going to do with stationery? Well, I'll tell you what I did. I gave it to Rick Fisher at the Christmas party next year. <laughs> you know, say, some gifts are like that, right? Right? Re-gifts, obligatory, last minutes. Uh, other gifts, however, are personal, and they are genuine, and they are well thought out, and you can kind of tell when you receive a meaningful gift, because such gifts convince you that someone is planned and uh, prepared and, and shopped and, and saved and searched. Those are the best gifts of all. Have you ever received such a gift? Well, hold that thought. We're going to turn our attention to God's Word. Now, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves uh, with this part in the Christmas story, but in order to explore the tradition of gift-giving and gift-getting, we must jump ahead to some months after the birth of Jesus. Matthew records in chapter 2 that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the, the time of King David, uh, excuse me, King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. 
He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report back to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. This is God's word. You call them magi, call them wise men, call them kings, although they were almost certainly not kings, but our tradition starts with them. Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all those boxes on your doorstep from Amazon, the malls, the countless trips to Walgreens for scotch tape, the wrapping paper, the gift bags, the ribbons and bows, and the credit card bill too, all of it points back to the Magi. They brought gold, they brought frankincense, and they brought, wait for it, there's myrrh. The Magi brought the first Christmas presents, and their gift-giving was an act of worship for the King of Kings and the Lord of all Lords. Gold for a king, incense for a lord, and myrrh for his death on a cross. Well-thought-out gifts, very personal gifts indeed. Gift-giving and gift-getting says much. So these are the two questions that we're going to look at this morning. One, what kind of a gift giver is God? And secondly, what kind of a gift receiver are we? A gift getting and gift receiving. First, what kind of a gift giver is God? Well, you know that when you open a gift or when a a gift is given, often it says much more about the giver than it does the receiver. You look at his gifts, his Christmas presents, pun intended, and would you look at that? It's a baby. And I suppose at first glance, uh, it seems kind of, well, ordinary. God has given an amazing gift but it arrives in such a simple package. But it's perfect, and it's just for you. The gift of God's Son is the perfect gift, and there is nothing that He wants more for you than for you to receive it gladly and to treasure it. Sadly, many do not. Sadly, many cannot they don't have the opportunity to see and hear the good news. And others are too caught up in their to-do list that they miss the very best part of Christmas. Others still will take a look at this story of Christmas, and, but they'll only think nostalgic thoughts. You know, it's nice. Heartwarming even. Silent night, a baby in a manger, swaddling cloths. Angels sing, shepherds come, wise men bring their gifts. Nice, sweet, got it, check. Now, back to real life. We'll be honest now, if uh, we could ask God for anything he wanted, what would it be? It's kind of a fun question to think about. What would you ask God for? If you could any anything you wanted. Kind of reminds me of that old fable about the poor couple who were given uh, the opportunity to make four wishes, all guaranteed to come true. They could ask for whatever they wanted, and it would be theirs. Well, it seemed too good to believe, and so they were kind of rather modest about their first wish, and they just asked for some good clothes. And lo and behold, when they looked in their closet, it was packed. Nice suits and dresses and coats and shoes. Wow, it was true. And so this encouraged them to wish for something better than their broken down cottage. And when they returned home, they found that it had turned into a mansion. Wow, wonderful. So now, you know, they they upped the stakes. Okay, they asked to be really, really wealthy. 
And miraculously, uh, they had untold riches, you know, gold, jewels, big piles of money. Okay, one wish left. How are they going to top all that? And, and so this was their thought. Let's ask to be like God. And their wish was granted, but not as they expected. All their stuff instantly disappeared. The clothes, the mansion, the riches, all of it gone. Nothing was left, of course, except for a manger and some hay. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like to be God. That's the kind of gift giver God is. A baby. A manger. Some straw. This is the perfect gift? Well, for many people, it just doesn't do anything for them. This is God's perfect gift? I'm not getting it. What? difference does it make? What, what difference does it make in the world? What difference does it really make for me? I mean, why does it matter? You know, it's nice, but perfect? Amazing? Is that you? Or maybe a part of you? Perhaps God's gift is not what you want it to be. Maybe you have an idea for something bigger, something better. Hey, I'll give you a Christmas confession. I guess it was uh, oh, about a month and a half ago. I was driving with my wife somewhere, and I had a brainstorm that went like this. Hey, Mary. You're probably not going to like this idea, but hear me out. How about if we buy ourselves our own Christmas gifts this year? Even the kids. You know, we'll give, think about this. We'll give them some money at Thanksgiving, and then they'll have two weeks to shop for themselves, and they'll bring all the gifts back to us, and then I'll wrap them all up, and then on Christmas Day, we can kind of all act surprised. <laughs> Come on, it makes sense. A lot less stress, quicker, easier. They'll get what they want, everything will fit, fewer returns, so much more practical. So what do you think? Do I have to tell you what you thought? Okay. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I get it. My big idea kind of misses the whole point of giving, doesn't it? The giving is not so much about the object as it is about the relationship between the giver and the receiver. Isn't that what gives a gift its true value? Now, don't get me wrong, uh, the right gift is part of the beauty. But even more important, really, is the relationship between the giver and the receiver. You know, so many times when it comes to spiritual things, we want to go shopping for ourselves, as if we know more than God for what we need. But God, if I only had this, or that, or this better job, or spouse child, bigger salary, whatever it is. And yet God knows us, and he gives us what we truly need. A problem comes in the receiving, that we don't recognize the gift. We don't see that his gift is far more wondrous than we think, and his gift is far more threatening than we understand. We really don't see ourselves as that needy. You see, gift-getting says something about the receiver as well. Tim Keller writes, Christmas is about receiving presents. But consider how challenging it is to receive certain kinds of gifts. Some gifts, by their very nature, make you swallow your pride. Imagine... 
opening a present on Christmas morning from a friend, and it's a dieting book. Now you take off another ribbon and wrapper, and you find that it's another book from another friend. Title, Overcoming Selfishness. Well, if you say to them, well, thank you so much. In a sense, you are admitting, for indeed I am fat and obnoxious. In other words, some gifts are hard to receive because to do so is to admit that you have flaws and weaknesses and you need help. Perhaps on some occasion you had a friend who figured out that you were in financial trouble and came and offered you a large sum of money to help get you out of that predicament. If this has ever happened to you, then you probably found out that to receive the gift meant swallowing your pride. Keller continues. He says, there has never been a gift offered that makes you swallow your pride to the depths that the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do. Christmas means that we are so lost, we are so unable to save ourselves that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save us. That means that you are not someone who can pull yourself together. You're not someone who can do it. You can live this good and moral life. It means that you and I need, desperately need, God's gift of grace. It is perfect. It is so well thought out. It's very personal, and it's for you. Listen, I bring you good news of great joy. A Savior has been born, hmm, there it is, to you. He is Christ the Lord. There has been born for you. Jesus is the gift. He himself is the treasure. Grace is what it is, and it changes lives because that's what he does. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. The only thing you can do is receive it, which maybe means admitting it and swallowing your pride that it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not, 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 not from yourself. You can't shop for yourself when it comes to salvation. You can't do it. It only comes as a gift. A gift, a gift, a gift, a gift. Not by works. It's like no one can boast, no one can brag it up. We're all in the same boat. It is a wonderful gift. Joy to the world, joy to you. It's not too early, it never is, to sing of your Christmas gift and treasure it in your heart. Each day, you can receive it anew, wow! Or you leave it unopened. That's up to you. Because see, here's the thing. God will not force his gift on you. He's not going to make you open it. He's not going to make you treasure it. He's not going to make you love him. He's not going to make you worship him. He's not going to make you follow him. That's not how relationships work. That's not what love is. Love receives and love gives. It's a gift. Speaking of which, what are you planning on giving Jesus this Christmas? A little gold, maybe? Frankincense or something? Myrrh? Don't bother. It's not necessary. It's really not the kind of gift God is looking for. A long time ago, 
actually around 400 AD, way back, there lived a man named Jerome, who is considered one of the greatest scholars of the Western church. What he did was he translated the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible into Latin. And while living in Bethlehem, him, he is said to have had this dream in which Jesus visited him. Now, in this dream, Jerome collected all of his money, and he offered it to the Lord as a gift. And the Lord said, I don't want your money. And so Jerome rounded up all of his stuff, his possessions, and he tried to give them to Jesus. Again, the Lord said, I don't want your possessions. And so third time, in this dream, he went to the Lord, but this time he asked. He said, what can I give you? Is there anything you want? Jesus, of course, simply replied, give me your sin." That's what I came for. That's what I want. I came to take away your sin. That is the true meaning of Christmas. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's the great Christmas gift exchange. We give him our sin. He gives us God's righteousness. He gives us nothing but grace. That's why he came. To save you. He didn't come to make you nice. He should be nice, but that's not why he came. He didn't come to make you a good person, whatever that is. Be a good person, but that's not why he came. He came to make you and keep you alive for always. He came to save you to save you from your sins. The forgiveness of sins is the greatest gift we could ever, 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 ever receive. It comes through a cross and shed blood and an Easter resurrection. He himself is the gift. He himself is the treasure. The gift is the giver himself. God is your gift, forgiveness of sins, life eternal. It's all yours, which means peace of heart. It means hope. It means future. It means love. It means joy. Grace is what it is. And it's so very, very well thought out. It's the perfect gift. It's personal very personal because it cost him everything. Here's how Augustine expressed it. The maker was made man, that he, the ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that the truth might be accused of false witnesses, that the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation suspended on wood, that the strength might grow weak, that the healer would be wounded, that the life might die. He gave away his life so that you would have life. He gave away his beauty so that you would be beautiful. He gave away his glory so that you would be glorious. How wonderful and how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ 
for you. The gift is the giver himself. It is perfect, and it is amazing, and it is exactly what we need. Amen. All right. I'd like to...